Ready to go? Come over and join us, my friend. I will. I'm getting this Dorito on my chair. Doritos. Well, good evening, everyone joining us late this, uh, I almost said cold winter night. It's cool, but it's not cold. It's not, it has been cold, but it's not cold now. Glad you guys could join us. We're going to look at this starting series tonight, How to Study the Bible. Uh, tonight we'll ask, ask the two questions, answer the two questions after we ask them, what is the Bible and why should we study it? This is part one. We'll do three or four parts of this. Got my co-host with me tonight, my co-pilot, Cameron, joining us. This is the pilot seat, though. That's so. the pilot seat. There we go. So what is the Bible? Let's ask, let's answer the question after we've asked it here. The Bible, of course, we've discussed this before, is a collection of 66 books about 40 different authors in three different languages on three different continents over a period of about 1,600 years. So it's a collection of books. So when we think of the Bible as being a book, it's really multiple books, right? Multiple small books uh, smashed together, com it's you know compiled to make the Bible. Three languages, what would the three languages be? Can you take a guess at that? I'm putting you on the spot, aren't I? So if oh, I, oh, I know. Um, Greek would be one. What's another one? No, okay. Okay. Hebrew, okay. the Old Testament. Okay. But now that would be a translation. So we've got Greek and Hebrew. Now, most folks don't get the third one, but there's a little bit of the third one, which is Aramaic, which is a regional language then. Uh, obviously very similar in, in root origin to Hebrew, but it's, it's a, a distinct different language. And some of the Bible does contain excerpts and bits of Aramaic. Christ will say things in, in the New Testament in Aramaic that gets put into the scriptures. In fact, it gets transliterated. It's brought over, straight over into the, in the New Testament. Anyway, 40 different authors, uh, 1,600 years, starting with the first author we assume is Moses. The Moses account uh, is many of the events that the Moses writes about would be happened long before he was born. The creation story, the flood narrative, all those things happened long before Moses came along. So one or two ways we, we get them this information, either... Uh, or maybe it's both of a com combination. Either it was orally passed down, which is possible. In that culture before written languages, things were passed orally. Or it was, or it was just divinely yeah. given straight to Moses. Now, it could have been both. It could have been passed to Moses, and then it's Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes these things down, edits it as he writes these accounts down. So there's no, no errors in that. So it's, that's those two um, possibilities I'm most comfortable with, either one of those or both of those in combination. So what's the Bible? The Bible claims to be inspired and inerrant without error, you know. It means that the Bible claims to be from God and that it is without error in everything it addresses. Now it's important that we stop for a second here and say just, just because the Bible claims to be inerrant wouldn't, wouldn't be proof that it is. I could say I've never made a mistake in my life. And see, since I don't make mistakes, I've never made a mistake. Or I never tell lies. Well, since I don't tell lies, that's a, that's a truthful statement, right? If I never tell lies, then what I say must be truthful. It gets into a circular argument. I don't think that we approach necessarily approach the, the discussion is the Bible without error because the Bible says so. I think we we approach it that way by looking at the manuscripts we do have and seeing seeing how well, manuscripts we do have, how reliable they are, uh, and we go to sort of this is what we were saying this reconstruct the New Testament. We look at all the thousand manuscripts we have, just the New Testament alone, and then we can rebuild that. Now. Is the Bible without error? Even if you could go back and replicate to the, with 100% certainty the original manuscripts, which we don't have the actual paper, but all those manuscripts and create a Bible, um, you still have to, on, to some degree of faith, believe either the supernatural in it or not. So you have to almost, when you boil it down to it, even if the authors were honest in what they said, um, you still have to come to it at the end of the day uh, and at some point and say, well, by faith, even though we can't establish 100% certainty, we believe this is the Word of God. And that's a complicated answer for another night. So I won't go much further than that. But I do believe the Bible is an error. I believe got the Holy Spirit, uh, who is a, a person of the Trinity, has divinely preserved his word through the ages. I believe that to be true. And the Bible is without error in everything it discusses. So the Bible does not discuss auto mechanics or quantum mechanics. So we can't use the Bible to make be an authoritative answer on either one of those subjects because it doesn't address either one of those subjects. But the Bible is authoritative on the creation of man, the fall into sin, the need for salvation, how salvation works, all those kinds of things the Bible does speak on and so has not made error in any of those areas, right? But the Bible contains, I'm going to let you read a lot of scripture tonight. The Bible contains many different styles of writing, such as poetry and narration, fiction. Uh, fiction, I mean, like stories that 
that were kind of made up to tell a point like a parable, history, law, and prophecy, and must be interpreted in the context of those styles. So you don't look at a parable in the same way you look at the Exodus account. When Jesus says a parable about a man who went out to sow some seed, it's not the same historical story. It didn't happen in time and space. A parable is a made-up story that has a teaches a meaning, right? We just we'll take, make up a story to teach a spiritual meaning. But when you read the Exodus account, that's not a made-up story to teach a parable, to teach a, teach, to teach a meaning. It's an actual historical event. Makes some sense? So history, law, prophecy, you must understand each of these and the type what they are. Otherwise, you're going to be led down a path which you'll be misinterpreting these. But the Bible is the source of Christian religion in that the Bible contains the words of God and how the Christians apply the words of God to his life. The Bible is our ultimate source of authority, isn't it? When we disagree in issues of morality, our, our ground, our base would be the Bible. We have to say, well, the Bible says this. That must settle the debate, right? So while you may have opinions about certain things, at the end of the day, the Bible, it must agree with the Bible or not. Just can't make up things willy-nilly. The Old Testament, we talk about there's two, two covenants, two, book, two collections of writings, Old New Testament. The Old Testament, the first five books are called the Pentateuch. In fact, you see the word penta means five, like a pentagram, pentagon. You think of the word penta being five. Five books, it's also just called the law. These have been historically uh, understood to be authored by Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Five books. And now, all the accounts of the Genesis story and some of the Exodus story take place before Moses was born. And some of the accounts after Moses' death uh, would be recorded in some of the later books, right? Like Numbers or whatever the case would be there. So the idea here is that Moses write them. Uh, yes, I think Moses is the author of these books. And we talked about that a moment ago. God divinely inspired him to write this, except for maybe the closing of the Exodus account, which Joshua pins that. But... While Joshua might write the end of Exodus, Moses gets the bulk of credit for, for the Pentateuch. Now, there's also the Old Testament historical books. There's 12 books that we consider classified as being history, historical events of the Old Testament, like Joshua. It's the conquest of the promised land. Judges, the same kind of thing. As soon as you get in the promised land, they go into the period of judges and they set up these judges to rule. And now, these aren't all in chronological order. In fact, Ruth is out of, out of sync here, but you have... First, second Samuel, Samuel, it's a period of time before, uh, but, but the end of the judges, before the kings start. And you got first, second kings, that's a period of the kings rising up. Um, and so you got uh, other chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, you got other books that don't, these aren't in sequence chronologically, but it's just grouped into a, a sum of books we call historical accounts. Then other book category of books are poetical. These next five books are books that are poetry. Now they're by different authors, but they're taught in poetic nature. Book of Job. Now, some people are divided where, where to put Job. Is Job poetry written by Solomon or a wise person with a pseudonym, a pseudonym made it all entirely made up? Or is Job a historical figure? I think Job is a historical figure. I think he was an actual historic figure. But what we see in Job, how it's written, is written in, in poetry. It's styled. Okay. Anyway, so you got Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Now, of those five books, Solomon wrote three of those. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Psalm, Song of Solomon. He wrote those three. David wrote many of the psalms but not all the psalms right and that's that's a bulk of the new testament and the last category of books would be the prophets are 17 books prophetical books of the old testament in the two categories there's no quiz on this so don't, don't memorize this uh, necessarily right now major and minor prophets the major prophets you're familiar with isaiah jeremiah limitations ezekiel and daniel and then the other remaining uh prophetic books the other 12 books are minor prophets now it's weird how we classify these, Cameron. They're really only classified major and minor in terms of the size of the books. The major prophets just fall in that category because it's just larger. There's Daniel, book of Daniel is bigger than Hosea and Joel and Jonah combined, right? And the other prophet, minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are all also prophets, and they're called minor not because they are little or young, but because their writings are small in comparison to the major prophets. And that's just the only difference in category. Not that what they said was less important than Ezekiel or Daniel, uh, but just that they have writ had written less. That's the only reason in the category. Now, that's the Old Testament. Now, if you may have an old Bible, that's often Roman Catholics have a Bible that has many books in between the uh, intertestamental books. 
There's the Bell and the Dragon, the First, Second Maccabees. There's a host of books that, of things that occur between Old and New Testament that uh, the Jews didn't count as, didn't credit as being fully inspired of God, so they didn't put that in their canon. Uh, and we didn't, as Protestants, put that in our canon either because the Jews didn't accept those books. And that's just kind of a, a very uh, curt and short definition of why those books didn't make into our canon. But that's basically the reason why. So now we enter the New Testament. You're familiar with these books. There are five historical books in the New Testament, books that recount historical events. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, those are Gospels. A Gospel is not a pure historical narrative, but it is enough that it follows an historical account. And then the book of Acts is just early church history. From, the, from, the, from Pentecost, early before Pentecost, uh, through the first martyr of Stephen, all the way up into about chapter 9, then Saul's conversion, and then the rest of his life, on to he makes it to Rome, close to makes it to Rome. So that's the book of Acts. Historical books, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. And then there's the Pauline epistles. Now you think, who is she? Well, that just means Paul's epistles. Uh, he has credit for writing 13, and we have 13 letters, epistles in a letter. An epistle is a letter from an apostle. That's what an epistle is, a letter from an apostle. 13 of these, and we have clear authorship given to Paul because, in fact, he begins by saying, I, Paul, an apostle, not of men of God, but of God, right? Uh, I, Paul, a bondservant of Christ. He identifies himself in the opening uh, address in all these, all 13 of these letters here. And you have listed there Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, 1st, 2nd Tide, Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And in fact, those are in order which you find in the New Testament. They're the epistles of Paul, all 13 of those listed in order. Here's a good memory tool for you if you want to memorize New Testament books. You've got the four Gospels. What are they? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right, and then you've got one book of history of early church history, Acts. book of Acts, and then you got Paul's thirteen letters. Romans, and, first Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Right. Ephesians. So if you want, here's a good mnemonic trick, a memory trick for this camera. If you're interested, Romans and First Second Corinthians. You got those two. Just memorize those two, and then the next is Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. G E P C, G E Power Company. Got it. G E Power Company. Then you have five T's, five T's. First thing of Thessalonians, first thing of Timothy, Titus. Got that? And then Philemon. If you get memorize that, then you boom, you have most of your testament knocked out. Five Gospels, Book of Acts, 13 Epistles of Paul. You got Romans, First Saint Corinthians, G Power Company, five T's in Philemon. Got it? <laughs> now that wipes that that takes care of the bulk of the testament, but this, we're not finished yet. Because there's 27 New Testament books. Then you have what's called the non-Pauline epistles which are, now Hebrews, some folks think that Paul wrote Hebrews. I don't think that. And if he did, it's the only thing he wrote that he didn't put his name on. And so I don't think he wrote that. I think it's an anonymous writer. Then you have, of course, James. And these are written by the authors that are named here. James wrote James. Peter wrote two epistles, first, second Peter. Then John wrote three little epistles, first, second, third John. And then you got Jude, another half-brother of Jesus, just like James, also wrote an epistle. And then you have John's longest letter, uh, is revelation. It is now people say it's not that's that's prophet. It is prophecy. It's apocalyptic, but it's also an epistle because it's written to seven churches. In fact, revelation. So anyway, that's the New Testament books. First question is this: Why do you think? Or what do you think about the different categories of scripture? Do you, do you like the idea that we put kind of put them in different categories? Mm -hmm. And if so, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? I think it's like chapters of a book, and I, I think. Because it has, there are different sections of a book. That's right. Like, if you want this type of writing, go here. If you want this type of writing, go here. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Having them organized. Now, the Bible doesn't itself create these categories. Yeah, we do. We put the categories on there. Oh, this fits in this kind of, we made the categories up. Yeah. But it's clearly, there's different it's types of literature. To understand, too. I think so. And you can understand that Proverbs does not read like the Gospel of Mark. Proverbs are these pithy little short sayings, uh, one after the other, boom, 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 right? And Matthew tells us, or Mark, or the Gospels tell a story, like Acts does. And so I think I like the categories. I like, in our mind, it helps me to kind of, though, I mean, God doesn't say that Proverbs is less inspired than the Gospel of Mark. It's all inspired by the same God. But I, I like the idea that we can put these things in categories. So here's the text. And we're going to look at a parable tonight, which is a story of fiction. 
It was really told by a real human being, but it's a made-up story to tell a deeper spiritual meaning, right? A parable is called a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? So I'm going to let you read a parable. Mark 4, 1 through 9. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it, <clears throat> sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang out quickly because the so soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. All right. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop. Some was applying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. All right. Whoever has ears is a good way of saying, um, if, you, if you're able to hear, you better listen up to this. Now, this is a parable, which means that these uh, elements of the story correspond to something uh, in reality, right? They, they have a they have a correlation to something in reality. It's teaching us a deeper spiritual meaning with these uses of metaphors and, and right these uh, images here. So he gave different types of soil. We see here four types of soil which correspond to these four different interpretations. So kind of help me out here. Let's see. Um, let's start with number four: the soil, the good soil. Where do you think which one is that? Does it is it receive the word? Now the the seed is the word. It's not a parable of the seeds, it's a parable of the soils. Because what's different in this story is really the different types of soil. The focus is on the soil, not the seed here. But the good soil, which one do you think that is? A, B, C, D, or D? It's a word received but has no roots. It's a word received and produces good fruit. You know, That's the one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The good soil produces fruit. How about the you know, thorny soil? The word's received but has no roots. Uh, Satan prevents the word from penetrating. Or the worries and desires choke the word. Yeah, it, it grows up, but um, but it's choked out. I think that's the one, right? Mm -hmm. I have to read the interpretation of this. Jesus gave interpretation of this. So I could be off. I'm, I'm not looking at this in a little bit here. Uh, let's see here, right? And then rocky soil. C. C. Right. It's like put. It's trying to plant seeds on a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really grow anywhere. It does. You know, it just can't. Mm -hmm. It can't establish a root. And. Um, so on the path, A. A. Yeah, that's right. It 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 can have soil. It can uh, it can grow, but it it can't get good roots because the roots can't go too deep because the, the ground is hard. That's it. Now here here's the Jesus is teaching in this that the word which is spoken and goes out, it lands on different types of soil or different types of ears. Some hearts are too hard to receive it. Some hearts can receive it, but because they're so wrapped up in the co the cares of the world, they can't. Uh, it can't produce fruit. Uh, so, some um, hearts receive this, but, the, but stress of the world and trials, it can't develop roots and it doesn't produce fruit. But there's one type of, of, of the four, one type of heart soil that actually takes the word and lets it grow in it. And that is the good soil. Right? Now, in the light of this parable, what must we do with the word of God? Spread it and share it. We must, that's right. I think in this case, the sower is God, but I think we, we can become the sower in the sense that we can spread the word. We're not responsible for the harvest, the production, but we are responsible for sowing the seed. Now, we think in terms of 21st century agriculture of these machines that go out and plant seeds in the ground and they make a pretty good pro harvest. But it's sort of like this. God is, he's so, okay, God's, plants the sowers and they sow the seeds right and those grow up to be sowers which sow more seeds and they grow up to be sowers yeah. and sow more seeds. now the seed is the word of god the seed is the truth that's yeah spoken. so that's why the god plants the word of okay god plants the seeds mm -hmm. which are the word of god and then more sowers come along. Let's just say they grow up into sowers. Right. And they plant well, more word of Producing God. fruit, right? The fruit produces maybe fruits into salvation, fruits, that sort of a thing. We're the soil, in, in this illustration specifically, a heart is the soil. 
And the word of God is the seed which, which has been planted by God. Or, or in this case, the planter. I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not to other... I, I always say this. You know, be careful yeah. don't overcook a parable. Let them just let it let it mean what it means on the surface and don't go too far much further than this because it, a parable typically teaches one or two things. It doesn't go much beyond that. You don't want to overdo a parable. But in this case here, our responsibility, of course, is to receive the word of God and our responsibility is for our heart soil, right? To receive it with gladness and to let it grow. See? Now let's look at, let's go to the Old Testament and read something from the Pentateuch. Let's read Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 12. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Now if Moses is the author, who do you think is using the personal pro pronoun me in this text here? Moses is the author. And then Moses. I'd say it's Moses, yeah. right? The Lord talked to Moses and Moses gave us the people. So these are the laws he's about to give in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 2. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord, your God, as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that the, you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and fill with all your soul and these with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build. All right. So this is obviously a promise from God to the people of Israel. Um, that They were to remember this all the ways, right? Put this, write these words on the door frames of your house, on your hands, time, and your forehead, make a sign so that you don't forget them. You're always, always referencing God's word. Now, is this written to us today well it was it, written to them it was but, written to them now but we can use it yeah we, we certainly what's implied is we are to obey obey the words of god but under this particular covenant we're not said that it's not said of us that if we obey the deuteronomy that we get to go to jordan today or palestine today and possess that land because this was written or spoken to a people of that particular covenant in that particular day. The principle we take from this as Christians is to say we ought to obey God's commands. But the question is which commands? Of course, these commands in Deuteronomy 6 will, will mostly relate to the Old Covenant commands, the, the law of the Old Covenant, which of course won't, they won't all pertain to you, right? Dietary laws, uh, laws related to circumcision, those kind of things don't relate to you specifically. But God was saying, if you love me, follow these laws, obey these commands. And if you do, it goes well for you. If not, we've got trouble here. We didn't finish. We didn't get to that? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Houses filled with all kinds of... Let's roll back to the previous slide and pick up that one. How about that one? When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses you filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, Wells you did not dig, and vineyards with olive and olive groves you did not plant. Then be then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt of the land of slavery. And that's all the text oh, here. So oh, thank you very much. Of the land of slavery. So what what's being said here is God is delivering them. It's a point of the history of the nation of Israel when they've been brought out of Egypt and before they get in, inherit the promised land. And he's saying, Look, I've you're going to walk into this land, and if you're obedient, if you're obedient to me, I'm going to clear the land. You're going to have all these cities you didn't build, the wells you didn't dig, the vineyards you didn't plant. All this stuff will be yours. I'll take care of you as long as you're obedient. Because who, whose land is it? It belongs to God. Now, the the uh, the covenant of the Old Testament was contingent upon their obedience, meaning if if they obeyed, they could get these things. If they did not obey, they were not allowed to get these things. Right? And of course. Uh, It'll say elsewhere at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses will circle back to this and say, look, now, when if you follow false prophets, if you follow false teachers, you follow idolatry and sin, God will send judgment upon you. But if you're faithful and obedient, God will bless you. 
That's kind of a, conting that's a contingent promise, isn't it? A conditional promise. Now, this is not written to Cameron Lee in the 21st century, no. these commands. But we can use it. Yeah, that's right. We can say, well, God wants us to obey the commands he's given to us in the New Testament and his moral law of the Old Testament. So there's a couple of questions we kind of get to the end of this tonight. Uh, how, is, uh, how is loving God the same thing as living according to his ways? And he said, live according to his ways. How is that loving God, living according to his ways? Well, because if you live according to his ways, you show you that you care about him and that you love him. Right. Just like obeying your earthly parents. Yeah. You demonstrate love by demonstrating obedience. And demonstrate you care about them, too. That's exactly right. And that you respect them. Yep, and that's another way you show love is to respect someone, your parents, to obey them, that sort of a thing. And so God, who is your Heavenly Father, the same thing applies there. If we uh, love Him, we will also obey Him. If we disobey Him, it shows we don't love Him. That's getting at that. And that's what He's saying in Deuteronomy here. You know, if you obey the commands, then I will do this for you. I will bless you. I will let you live in houses you didn't build and cities you didn't, didn't fortify and eat from vineyards you didn't plant and drink from wells you didn't dig. I'll give you all this stuff if you're obedient. Now, they were obedient in periods of time, and enjoy prosperity in the land, but they didn't ultimately, because at some point they will apostatize and fall away from the faith, and horrible things happen. Question four. Why was it important for ancient Israel to remember God as they moved into promised land? Why was it so important that God said, don't forget, I brought you out of Egypt, you got to remember that. Because then they'll turn away from God if they don't. They'll fall away. That's exactly right. And if you were to take a step back and take a kind of a microcosm view of ancient Israel up until the up until the Christ <laughs> right big picture thing you'll see almost almost every other generation fell into sin and every other generation came out of the sin with national repentance and revival you got it thank you for the hand gestures and so it was true that promise continued on until their ultimate falling away by rejecting Christ that would happen ultimately but look for that period of time from from 1500 year period of time from Moses leading them out of the, in the Exodus to 70 AD, the rejection of Christ. And ultimately, we see a period of national revival and decline into sin and so forth and so on. We see a period of good kings and bad kings. We see a prophet would come along and they would come back and, and repent oftentimes. Uh, but either way, ultimately, the promise was not kept by the people. Now, how can keeping the law. Uh, safeguard a person from sin well because if you keep the law which is the ten commandments right right yeah if you keep the law then you're not sin like then you're that's less sin you're doing mm -hmm. yeah so if you if you it's like saying if how, how can not sinning keep you from sinning yeah <laughs> it's a it's a weird way of saying it but that's right if, if obedient to god but obviously that's not all the sin though it's just the like the main like, not most important, but, like, the po most popular sins. Yeah, I think the Ten Commandments give us a broad application to, of... to uh, morality, right? Yeah. So, if you cheat on your taxes and don't pay the government what's, what's due, there's nothing in the Ten Commandments that says, that says that specifically, right? But it does say you shouldn't steal, right? If you, if you go to work and you sleep on a job and you do poor work and you leave early every day, well, you say there's nothing in the Ten Commandments about that. Well, actually, you're stealing from your employer. And thou shalt not steal is covered into that. Does it make some sense? Um, so the Ten Commandments really are God's moral law written down. And it is vague enough or, you know, uh, broad enough, I'll say, that we can understand this in various concept, uh, uh, contexts. Okay. Question six. What does this passage teach about God's provision... As we see in the Old Testament, God's provision and our gratitude. If God's provided for us, we'll be grateful. That's what he's saying. When you go, he said to them, when you go to the promised land and you, you drink from wells you didn't dig, eat from vineyards you didn't plant, live in cities you didn't, didn't build, you go in here and run the people out and you take over the promised land, don't forget that you didn't do this on your own. I've given that to you, right? So be grateful, have gratitude for what I provided for you. Didn't they end up actually turning away from God in the future and... Everything else. Ultimately, it, ultimately, they reject every prophet sent to them. And ultimately... And they turn to other gods, right? They would. They'd fall into the idolatry of the gods of the Canaanites and the Baal worship. They'd fall into idolatrous sins of all sorts. Ultimately. But they're the nail in the coffin, no pun intended, the final nail was in the crucified Christ of the cross. That was the final rejection. And that was the thing which 
what is the final apostasy or falling away of the of the Jews from that covenant. Yeah. See if the slides move for. I think I may have messed up the slides. So, oh, we're way off of that. We're in the beginning. We never none of the slides. All right, I, I, that's not a problem. Let me just. Merry Christmas. That's all right. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pull that up. I just want to show a couple things. We don't have to go any further than this. Sometimes these things kind of get all a little janky here. A little messed up. And in the meantime. All right, bud. So there we go. There we go. I don't need to show you guys the books of the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, and that was the first question at the gates. I'm going to push down through here. I want to get us to where we are now. How about that, my friend? Okay, my friend. The, fo the following Bible tools can be helpful. Now, there's good Bible. Here's different types of Bible tools. Bible commentary, Bible dictionary, Bible atlas, concordance, and study Bible. Now, if you look close in the bookshelf behind me, I have multiple versions of each of these. Multiple commentaries. Dictionaries, Atlas, Concordance, and Study Bibles. Reference, Christology, Theology, Doctrine, and Classification. So let's, let's look at each of these very quickly here. We're talking about how to study the Bible. What is a Bible commentary? What do you think that is? Probably people talking about the Bible. Right. It's people's commentary or comments on the Bible. Uh, so, now, the commentary is not divinely inspired, but there's good commentaries out there. In fact, sometimes you read a passage and say, well... I don't know what that truly means. Well, I say read some good commentaries. Uh, pick up multiple commentaries. And we would, men have thought about this as they study these words, right? Uh, they, uh, they, they're they trying to make sense of a Bible passage based upon its historical context, what was going on. And so a, a commentary, read different commentaries, helps us capture that. In fact, when I do a sermon, when I preach a sermon, I usually consult, um, I use a software program, but four or five different commentaries when I do it. I always want to see what other people say about this text before I settle on, on a particular thought. A Bible dictionary. What's a Bible dictionary? What's a, a dictionary? Whoa, it's like an explanation or like the definition of something. That's what a word means. Yeah, it's a dictionary. so maybe it's like a bunch of the words in the Bible, the definitions to them. Or maybe it's a bunch of these passages and stories well, in the Bible and definitions. It's what different words mean. The, so what is a Philistine? Right? They would say, I don't know from memory, a Philistine is a man who lives in ancient Israel and... I was lived in the promised land before the conquest. It was a Philistine, right? So a Bible dictionary defines words you might find in the Bible that you're unfamiliar with, right? A Bible atlas. What do you think a Bible atlas does? It's basically like a Bible dictionary. Uh, that's right. It shows maybe the geography of the Bible lands. Pictures of where... The topographic or geographical maps of the ancient world in, in that part of the country. That part of the world, right? It shows... So you can see images of what it looks like. Or it shows oftentimes... Fragments of pottery, pictures of these kinds of things that are important to understand what the Bible is about, right? You say, I've never been to the Sea of Galilee. Well, you get a Bible atlas, and there's many photographs. You can see what it looks like without ever, ever having to go there. Uh, since we have access to the Internet nowadays, you can do virtual tours of the Promised Land, of the Holy Lands, by just going to certain websites. Cameras go around. They've got satellite images. It's just a virtual image of this stuff. Concordance. The concordance is just listing of different verses. So if you want to find something on sadness... Flip to sadness, there's multiple passages on sadness in, that you find in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You want to find something about, say, uh, the resurrection. You flip in the concordance to the word resurrection, and it shows all these different references in the Bible to the resurrection. Or any topic that would be in a concordance, you could just flip to it, and it has the passages there. And then lastly, a study Bible. A study Bible is, is a Bible with extra notes, right? Which probably has all of these in it to some degree. A study Bible is a Bible with extra uh, Commentary, dictionary, atlas, all these things put into it uh, to help illuminate the passage. Make some sense? So if you want to study the Bible, I encourage you to buy each of these. And if you say, well, I don't have the budget to buy all these things. Well, that's fine. Yeah, it is fine. Yeah, if, it, if you have the internet and you if pay for internet, internet yeah. you don't have to buy any of these things. Mm -hmm. you, there's a lot of really good websites you can go to that, and that shows information on all these things. And so if you don't want to have, have a paper version of a book in your house uh, for lack of space or the cost, you can do it at, you know, if you have a subscription internet and have a device, you can access the internet. All this stuff is a, is a click away. You know, we live in a day and age where information is easy to obtain if you just want to look for it. But I always encourage folks, get a good study Bible, and that goes a long way. All right, let's move on if we can here, Cameron. 
Choose a Bible that's right for you. We've talked about this some in the past. I just want to kind of show you, if you're trying to figure out which Bible works best for you, I want to go over these three categories and then close out with one verse in the New Testament and then show you different versions of that verse to see how, how it makes, uh, how the difference is. So the first is, the first category is a literal or word-for-word -word translation of the Bible. Now, the Bible is not written in English. So these are English translations of the Bible. The Bible, let's just say the New Testament, for example, is written mostly in Greek. So, since we don't have invested the time to learn the Greek language, right, a new alphabet and new language and new words, we want this in the English language. Now, if you want a word-for-word, -word, literal translation, there's five of these good ones on the market now. The most literal would be the New American Standard. It's wooden. It's, it's really literal. Uh, but it's a good, a very good trend. In fact, in Bible college, that was what was recommended to us to use as a New American Standard. In fact, I got the Bible over here somewhere. New American Standard of Faith since Bible college. I have to find it. Uh, I should have had that to show people. But anyway, a New American Standard Bible. Oh, wait. And then number two, another word for word is the ESV, English Standard Version. That's one I preach from nowadays. I use it. ESV, it's, it's a more word for word. It's not as wooden literal as New American Standard, but it is a, it is a very good word for word more literal translation king james version that's when we grew up I, I, that's right i grew up in the poetic nature of you know 17th century english i've gotten used to that but uh the problem with an older english translation is some of the words may have changed over time but again there's nothing wrong with the translation itself it's a good one and if you like if you like the structure of the king james the new king james is for you it's a more modernized english translation uh using the same text as the king james version and then the new Revised Standard Version. Again, those are good literal translations. Use those when you can. Uh, but if you say, well, that's a little hard for me to understand, I'd like to capture a more dynamic translation, a more thought for thought, because some English or some phrases don't translate well from one language to another. Some, you have to kind of capture the thought. Like an example would be, here's an idiom that we use. Idioms are hard to translate. If I said right now, it's raining cats and dogs outside. I need to go for that. That's a common one, right? Well, if I translated that literally into, into Russian, they would think, that makes no sense at all. How are animals falling from the sky? But now, what does the idiom really mean? It's pouring out there. It's pouring real hard out there. It's, it's, it's coming really... down in buckets and coming down in sheets, isn't it? Well, that's more idioms. That's more idioms. <laughs> it's raining with force. A lot of rain falling from the sky. Well, that's how you would translate that. So if I said... It's raining cats and dogs. You could not translate that literally, word for word, but the meaning is what you want to capture. So you want to capture, capture idioms especially, and there's a lot of idioms in the Bible. You want to capture that thought for thought, and good translations recognize when you have to do that. So some of those would be the Holy Christian Standard uh, Bible, New English Translation, New International Version, a cent uh, I think century, New Century Versions, um, Good News Translation. Those are some examples of more dynamic now those are these first two categories are actual translations of bibles the, the third category is not a translation at all it is a paraphrase a paraphrase is when you take an english bible and you you paraphrase it like paraphrase this statement for me uh jim and i went to the store and bought soda crackers at the store you and J at the store, Jared and Jim bought soda crackers. Right. Or you could paraphrase even, paraphrase even more and say, Jim and Jared went to the store and bought crackers. You can paraphrase a, a, a thought, all right, and it makes good sense. We know what it says, but a paraphrase is not a translation. In fact, of these three categories, I would say this is the one you least want to use if you want to get mm -hmm. to the heart of the matter. Yeah. Because a paraphrase is always filtered through the guy paraphrasing. Yeah. A, a paraphrase is most susceptible to uh, being yeah, m misunderstood. And a person having an agenda uh, could use a paraphrase and, and, and mislead you. So I would say, well, I'm not going to say never use a paraphrase. It, it, may, have, it may be good sometimes. I, I certainly have read through paraphrases and like, oh, that's a neat way of saying that. Now... I don't preach on paraphrases because it's not, it's, I don't consider it as the, the Word of God. I don't consider it as close, it's not a translation. Right. So those are categories. If you have any of these, read them, right? Com commit yourself to reading this. If you, if you come across a difficult passage, say in the, in the New King James, like, oh, this is, I don't get what this means. 
Go to a more dynamic translation of that. Read it through a dynamic translation. Get you some Bible commentaries. Get study Bible. Read it through that. And then if you say, okay, I've got to grasp what this means. Let me see what a paraphrase might say about this. Let me read a paraphrase. Oh, well, that was a funny, that's a neat way of saying that. All right, let's close out with this. Let's read Romans 13, 3. And let's alternate, you and me. We're going to read the same exact verse in the Bible, Romans 13, 13. But this time, I want to show, I think, five or six different translations of the same verse, just to hear how they read differently. I'm going to start off by reading the New American, and we'll go every other time. How about that? Here's the New American Standard Bible's translation of Romans 13, 13. Now listen, as I read it now, we're going to go and listen to how different they are. Let us not behave, uh, excuse me, let, I almost messed up. <laughs> let us behave proper. I was about to say, let us not misbehave. That wasn't in there. Let us behave properly as in the day. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and what, what wantonness, not in strife and envying. Now that was the King James Version. Notice that there are some 17th century common words there that we don't use today. Chambering. Wantonness. Yes. Yeah. Chambering is sleeping around, uh, wantonness is being out of control, drunkenness, strife is fighting somebody, envying, you know, is jealousy. So while all those words still have those meanings, we don't use them commonly. So Romans 13, 13 might not be as clear in an older English translation. So I'm going to now, now show you an example from a more dynamic translation, the, the NIV, the New American Standard, a New International Version. Let us behave decently, as in daytime, and not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Even some of those words, they were kind of hard for us, weren't they? Debauchery. How about the Good News translation? Let us conduct ourselves properly as people who live in the light of day. No or orgies or drunkenness, no immor immorality or indecency. Indecency. Oh, and... It looks like indecency. Yeah. Okay. It is. <laughs> it is indecency. <laughs> no fighting or jealousy. Now, this is a, a, it is a translation, but it's a very modern translation of this, isn't it? Um, so that, that that's understandable, isn't it, for the most part? Mm, not exactly. Some of those words didn't come out. How about, the? Now this is a paraphrase, the message. We can't afford, go ahead, read it. <laughs> I forgot about it. No, go, go ahead. We can't afford to waste a minute. We must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity. frivolity and indulgence and sleeping around in disputation and bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Now, boy, that was very different than the New America Standard literal and the King James literal translations. This was entirely paraphrased. But did you get what it meant here? Yeah. Yeah. So if you read Romans 13, 13 in literal, dynamic, and a paraphrase, you kind of get what it's getting at. What is it getting at? It's telling you what not to do. Like what? What are some things it like, tells like you not to do? No. Uh, Don't wait, sleep no, around. I, I know. Um, it's listed right there. No squandering. No, I, I want to put it in my words. No. Here. No. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, go ahead. Not being drunk. Not de not like doing bad sexual acts, mm -hmm. not being jealous, not being angry. Yeah, causing fights. Causing fights. Yep, and if if that was difficult for you, or the King James more literals were difficult for you, go to the the next. Go to dynamic like NIV or Good News translation, and then if that's still difficult for you, it doesn't hurt to read a me the message only. For some understanding, don't I wouldn't preach from this, and I wouldn't I wouldn't say quote from this as being the text because it's only as a paraphrase. I would I would also go to commentaries and read what people have said about these passages because it makes maybe makes some more sense. But that's just an example, guys, and I hope that you've got some of this, something out of this tonight. What is the Bible? It is God's divinely revealed word. It's sixty six books of thirty nine Old Testament, twenty seven New Testament books. You got that different categories tonight, and. Um, been translated from three languages and two, written by 40 authors, 1,600 years, I think we said earlier. Here's a few more questions to close out. 
Why do you think there are so many English translations, Cameron? Why are there so many English translations? Because there's so many different people that need so many different translations. It might be easier for some to understand one or some to understand others. Yeah, so I think that it's born out of some kind of need, right? So the cynic in me says, well, because these publishers want to make money with their translations. That's only, that's a, is a part of it because it, it's a business to make translations of the Bible. But I think that in the marketplace where there's a need, it is always filled. I do think there was a need for, there is a need for uh, different English translations because they help us understand the text. So I, I agree. There was a need for it, and I also agree that there was uh, a need. There was also a desire to make money off of a new translation. So I think that those things, obviously, there's nothing wrong with that. Go hand in hand. Uh, good scholarship of these texts help us understand. It's a win-win for all of us, isn't it? You know, we are fortunate to live in a day and an age when we have at our fingertips, literally, at our fingertips, any translation that you want. I don't just mean the books on the shelves. I mean, if you have a smartphone with internet access. You have Bible apps. In fact, you've got a Bible app or two on your phone, don't you? And I, I do as well. I've got, I think, three translations of Bible apps on my phone. I use King James, ESV, and NIV. I have those three a pack around all the time with me. Anytime I want to read a verse, boom. I've got one that has all of the translations mm -hmm. in English. You can't beat it. So why are there so many English translations? Well, I think we win for this. Is there a benefit for it, for this? Well, sure. Mm-hmm. So many different ways to understand the word and more widespread. Absolutely. Are all Bible translations created the same? No. No. Some are much better than the others. <laughs> some are by far better than the others. In fact, paraphrases don't even fit in the category of translations, right? <laughs> it's a different animal. But start the more literal. That's where you want to start. And if that's a little fuzzy or difficult to understand, go to the more dynamic. And I'll kind of camp out in those two. Only go to a paraphrase. Just if you want to read a passage, a passage of scripture uh, in one setting, I think it helps with the paraphrase. It kind of gets the idea of how it feels, and you go back in the text and read it. What do you like more, the KJV or the ESV? I've gotten used to, well, I think I like the ESV. It's more readable. I think the scholarship behind both books, are, I'm going to say they're, they're equal. I don't think that one is more scholarship than the other. ESV is a very conservative translation. In passages where there could be a dispute, it takes a more conservative approach, theologically speaking. Um, it's, it's a more modern English. You know, every, any good translation needs to be revised as at the same speed of the English language. Or if you're translating to French, at the, the same speed that that language evolves, you must keep your translations up to that speed. I don't mean we're changing the originals. Not at all. I just mean as words change, we need to make sure that the words we use now match what the word was said originally. Does that make some sense? Now, there's a bunch of these. Um, we said chambering. A minute ago, we saw chambering. That just means sleeping around, doesn't it? Don't sleep around. Uh, now, a very, very good word at the time, but we've lost that in culture, haven't we? So we, we always keep keeping up to speed with how the language is, is coming along. Let me give an example. We're adding words every day to the English language. If you would have told me 20 years ago, uh, send me a tweet, I would have had no clue what you're talking about. I would have thought, I'm not a bird. I can't tweet anything, right? <laughs> or... Um, I saw something on Facebook the other day. If I heard Facebook 20 years ago, I thought it was an actual book. I wouldn't have thought that it was a um, online social media. There was no social media, you know, 25, 30 years ago. There was nothing like that around. So I wouldn't have even had an inkling about that being a social media, right? And so we create words as we invent things. Our language just takes different changes we go through time anyway. So I think that as language changes, we make sure that we use the language that reflects the understanding of this age from transporting ideas from the time it was written. Got it? And last question. This is one we didn't really get to tonight, and I think we need to finish up with this. Why is it important? We, just, we define what the Bible is, the different types of Bible translations. Why is it important, Cameron, that we study the Bible? I find two reasons off the top of my head. Number one, so we can better understand it. Mm -hmm. And number oh, and and so we don't go down the wrong path. Okay. And number two, so that way we remember God and stay with Him and make sure He doesn't fade away in our lives. Very good. So do that like re regularly. Remember God, I guess. Learn mm -hmm. learn more about Him. The Bible is is, is a depth of of mind. You can mind the Bible the rest of your life and never get to the bottom of it. We're just scratching the surface of the Bible. So it helps us know about us, about God, about what is right and what is wrong. That's true. That's why I study the Bible. 
It's right. a good way of it's, life. It is the most at, most correct way of being understand who God is, what his message is for us. And that's that's it. Now we're going to do a part two and three or four to this. I want to get into more of why we study the Bible and how we can study the Bible as we go forward. But I appreciate you joining me tonight. Thank you, Cameron. I tried this last night kind of late and you were about to go to bed, so we had to postpone it to tonight. Thank you guys that watched this for tuning in. If you're watching this in, re in reruns, syndication, um, and you think, I, I, he said something wrong, or I want to add to this, I always type the comments and as I post this from on my YouTube channel, you'll see, I'll see it and I'll always make comments or if I know you, you know, if I know you, I will re reply to your social media accounts or whatever. I'll get it back to you. Yeah. Also, bro, it was like 12 o'clock. That's not kind of late. Huh? It was very late. But anyway, okay. uh, I want to say as we close up, tonight, whoever cl cleaned the parking lot of the church today, I don't yeah. know who it was. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Very kind uh, deed. Once that sunlight hits that asphalt, it really melts it fast. And we wouldn't have had church today if somebody hadn't gone out there in the kindness of their heart to donate the time to... And the gasoline for their equipment to clean off the equipment, uh, the parking lot, I really appreciate that. And it was really nice to get there and have some parking spaces available uh, to go and have church today. So thanks to whoever did that. We would have no church if we hadn't done that. Um, that's all I've got. Any, oh, there's some, several prayer concerns today. Uh, I think the Rice family lost someone this past week. Um, I didn't hear any reports of COVID cases. We mentioned um, Texas, right? <laughs> Uh, people with that power in Texas and the rough times they've had. Pray for a warm up, uh, only only to gonna melt the ice in, in Texas, right? Any pressing prayer concerns, bud? Um, not on my mind right now. All right, we'll close that in prayer. Thank you again. Thank you guys again for joining us, and uh, look to see you guys Wednesday night, oh. weather permitting, and hopefully Jerry can come back and join us. Hope he feels well coming Wednesday and come back here and join us, and we'll pick it back up with uh, Romans part three, right? Let's close out. Our Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings of life. We thank you for allowing us to come and study your word. And Father, we're thankful that you've preserved your word and they're made so available to us. These, Father, these last days we're in, that uh, information is so readily available at our fingertips. We just thank you that you've uh, preserved it and kept it and that we can access this easily. And Father, we pray for those in Texas who are suffering with the ice storm and the, and the snow storms. We pray that you'd be with them and would... Uh, put protection around them that you restore the power this week we pray for that for warming uh, warming temperatures rising temperatures follow to melt some of the ice away uh, father we ask for uh, prayer for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones we think we think now of the rice family we ask you to be them in a very special way be with that family that have lost loved ones follow be with those suffering with the COVID-19 um, all just be with us as a nation we ask these things in Christ's name amen, amen. Thank you, Cameron. I'll just shut things off. And God bless you guys. Have a good week. We will see you Wednesday night. You put your brave hat down there. <laughs> no. Thanks, Galloway. That's some people.